lost deep in the pages of your Bible are the books that are unmentioned, unheard of, and unread. They are the forgotten books of the Bible. Hey, welcome to Your Church Friends Podcast. I am Chris. I'm Jordan. Congratulations. On? On the big thing. I'm so lost. <laughs> Congratulations on two years of podcasting. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Around my house, like, well, whatever we're working on, and whether it's like, I hope Delilah, or we're hoping Casey, or whatever. So it's a group project. And I'm like, hey, good job on that. And our thing is like, thanks, I did it myself. <laughs> so you're like, two years of podcasting. I want to be like, thanks, I did it myself. Yeah, oh, you did. <laughs> yeah, we've reached two years. That's crazy. Man, I was really just like, what did I forget in my life? <laughs> yeah, that's one of two congratulations. Second one is number 18 of uh, the top 50 dads in podcasting from Podcasting Magazine. Oh, yeah, I didn't do Podcast that. Magazine. Yeah. Thank you, everyone who voted. Yeah, thank you, everyone who voted. Uh, that was super huge and super cool that we went from 22 last year to 18 this year. And I guess our quest for next year is it has to be number one. Yeah, because I'm going to be aware of it next year <laughs> and promote it. So thank you, all of Chris's friends and otherwise. Who... Yeah, well, I put it on our page, so some of them have to be your friends. Yeah. Yeah. I have some of those. Yeah. My church friends. Uh, but super cool. A lot of cool things happened for us in June. And uh, June is usually when we celebrate our anniversary of recording. And then this, the podcast magazine started doing the Father's Day thing. So that's why it comes out in June. So oh, inciting. Mm -hmm. You were looking at me and I was like, did I, did I forget my wedding anniversary? Like, what are you going to go? We've already <laughs> talked about that. I have a kid. What could it possibly be? You have a kid, you moved, and uh, those are it, right? So far? So far. Yeah. Next month is anniversary. Oh, really? Yeah. July? Yeah. I didn't know that. 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. Wow. We're going on 14 in November. Nice. It feels like longer, but <laughs> that's for another episode. <laughs> All right, let's get into our forgotten book. Of Joel. Of not Joel and not Jude. It's <laughs> Oh, Haggai. yeah, Jude. That was what I thought it was. <laughs> So for everyone listening, we sat down and I opened up all my notes and we're sitting here looking at the stuff and Chris goes, all right, so how do you say that name? Zerubbabel? I'm like, that was so many episodes ago. Why are you still trying to ask me? Like, yeah, it's Zerubbabel. I'm like, wait, why are you asking about Zerubbabel? Aren't we recording Joel today? Jude. Haggai. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how this episode goes. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a great one. Thankfully, I have all of my notes saved so i was yeah. able to pull those up and, and study over them i'm excited for this again I, it rekindled the excitement that i had from last haggai and also it means that our joel episode should be really good because i'm studied ahead of time jude <laughs> <laughs> are we leaving these in there <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that was the other thing i went into our shared notes folder and i saw the yeah note the, it was for joel for joel mm -hmm. and i was like yeah i'll click the j name None of this sounds familiar to the thing I've been studying. So, man, these books are so forgotten that we're, we're in them and forgetting them. We're forgetting them while we go along. Where's the archangel part? That's not in here. Uh, but that's going to be in Jude when we cover that. Jude is really cool. I'm excited. Jude is, Jude is going to be fun. I think it's going to open some doors for us to dip into some of the other stuff that we were talking about. But maybe that's why you're looking forward to Jude so much. You just want to get there. Um, I'll give you an out. That's why. That's why. All right. <laughs> uh, recap on Haggai, the book we're in, since everyone forgot about it. The breakdown is basically, there, there's just four sections. Uh, Haggai gives four messages, and then in between there, there's a response from the people, which is super cool, and we'll get more into that this week. I know the last time we recorded, you were like, you can't just skip over that section. It's my favorite part. We'll look more into it today. But like we were saying, the people of Israel were taken captive by Babylon. They were in the land, and then... Cyrus took over from Babylon. He conquered Babylon, the Persians, and he allowed them to go back home. So this has now been 70 years from exile to Babylon in a journey home that's about five months long. And that was some of the recap of last week. Sure was. Sure was. Murdoch's on there with me. He's recapping with us. So about, uh, about 50,000 people have said that they're going to go home. That's where they're going to go to. And then uh, there they got started working on the temple. But when things got too tough, they stopped and began to work on their own homes. 
and this being more of our applicationable, practical episode, the first thing I wanted to get into was this term, give careful thought to your ways. At least that's the translation in my Bible. What did I say last week? It was 38 verses. And five times in 38 verses, Haggai's message comes with, give careful thought to your ways. And I, I really thought going into this before we touch into anything else, that that's such a key part of this book is how we think about things, the ways that we live. Yeah, I'm giving careful thought to my words now, but it really is. And I know that it's been been said so many times, watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. Watch your character. It becomes your destiny. And really starting with those thoughts and so much of our life just runs on autopilot to where there's either things that at one point we've put careful thought into and that just set us on a path or we just haven't put careful thought into and we're still set on a path, right? Mm -hmm. And really what changes the direction is how we think. And I think that giving careful thought, it ties in and I'm maybe stretching a little bit here, but I think it's kind of cool looking at repentance in the New Testament, just as far as being on a path and changing your path having to do with your thinking, because um, the word for repentance is metanoia which is like a transformation of your mind, a transformation of your thoughts. It's changing your mind about something, right? And from therefore, your actions follow. So definitely when we're looking at this book of giving careful, what does it say? Mine says it differently than yours. How does yours say it? Mine is give careful thought to your ways. And that's the NIV pre-new edited of okay. edition. Yeah, over in my Berean Study Bible, it's consider carefully your ways. So pretty much, but just really looking at God calling that to attention. Uh, yeah, he's like, hey, let's correct the course here. Mm -hmm. Think about what you're doing. Yeah, and I, I really like that you brought it in the way of repentance because uh, you brought it up. It's the rethinking. I've recently liked the term or thinking about it as a, a rewashing, like God's rewashing our brain almost in the sense, and people be like, you mean brainwashing? And like, yeah, actually brainwashing. Because your brain's dirty. Your brain is dirty and your brain has already been washed by the filth of this world. And in order to re-clean it and wash it out of it and flush it out, we need to have repentance. And that's what that does is it allows God to rewash our brain in the way he wants us to move and how he wants us to think. But our thoughts are so important. Like you're saying, it is the beginning of everything starts with your thoughts. That's the important part. And I think this is what Haggai is really... Cause He's challenging them to do something that they're essentially afraid to go back to do, and that's rebuild God's temple. Like the people are afraid, and they're like, I'd rather just do my own thing. And he's like, no, 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 we got to change that thought process. So give careful thought to your ways. Right, because they had set out to do that, and they got shut down. So again, that path that they were on, let's go do it. Like you said, the fear moves in, they got shut down mm -hmm. and all the stuff. So then what does it say in verse 2, chapter 1? These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. So that's what they're thinking. Hey, it's not time yet. We got shut down. But God says, consider that. Yeah. Think about what's going on here. Think about what's happening. You and your mind have said it's not time, but I didn't tell you it's not time. Which I think that in God saying it is time, in that careful consideration, he's trying to say, can't you look around you and see that it's time? You know, because you've kind of forgotten about me and what, what you're supposed to be doing for me. So can't you look around and see the effects of that thing? Again, I think that if you just go in with the thoughtlessness, you might not see the signs around you. One of the things I've been telling the kids lately, because they've been like, they'll spill something at the house or they'll bump into each other or do something. And they're like, it's an accident. And I'm like, okay, I've allowed that term to float around the house for like the last, Remy's almost 10, so 10 years. Accidents happen, of course, always accidents happen. But lately, I've been more on like, all accidents stem from one simple thing, carelessness. Mm -hmm. You were just careless. You were careless in this. So uh, if you accidentally hit your sister with your lightsaber, it wasn't that you were actually, it was an accident. It was carelessness. It, it all stems from that idea of not fully thinking about your surroundings, giving careful thought to your ways. And it's, it's like a small lesson I'm trying to teach them of give careful thought to your ways like think about what you're doing your environment and where you're at because if not then yes that will lead to an accident but a majority of the time most accidents i would assume are preventable yeah and it's interesting when you're talking about even just flailing your arms around right and carefully considering because 
going back to that thing of your thoughts become your habits and it just becomes the way that you do things. So if you're a little kid or if you're me or whatever and you just know that you're in an area where you can stretch out and do and you're not going to hit stuff because if I'm outside, who cares what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. But if I've put thought into the fact that, hey, if I'm inside or around people, I need to rein in how I'm flailing my body, right? And it just becomes part of how I function. I can still flail kind of, but there's a natural limit put on the thing mm -hmm. to, to avoid those accidents. Right. So it's those things of carefully thinking, you're putting limits or you're putting direction or you're putting whatever. But what I just said, based off of what you said, I don't think is going to tie into what the scriptures are actually no, talking about, but I'm just, I'm interested in yeah. what you're saying. So I was going yeah, to build enough of it. Where the, the story of Haggai eventually progresses to, but the just the idea that uh, that verse, or that sentence being said in five times throughout the small book, I mean, it can just lead to that concept being a major theme is in everything you do, give careful thought to your ways, no matter if it's going to be like, we'll look at in a section, in the section coming up, finances and all that stuff, that if you're giving careful thought to your ways out the gate, especially when it comes to God and being obedient to him, then that's going to help in so many other areas of your life. If you're giving careful thought to your ways in your finances or your obedience to God, then, then you're going to see the benefits of that, right? This book talks about uh, from this day on, I will bless you. And it, but that, a lot of that stems from after they were obedient and giving careful thought to their ways. I think that what ties into giving careful thought to ways is you said that that phrase is brought up five times. When I'm looking between the word declares and then also coming in says God or says the Lord that that's happening 13 times throughout these 38 verses right so when you look at so how am I supposed to think about things and then you just have God saying in this book through Haggai the Lord says this the Lord says this mm. the Lord says this the Lord's declaring this the Lord says this right mm -hmm. and I think that in the consideration of our ways we need to consider them against what the Lord says, because otherwise, where does the correction come from? Because I can be ignorant, I can have forgotten, I can, you know, whatever the things are. And that's where, again, I'm so like this book is because the Lord says this and the people said, let's go with that. That's such a great point. I'm glad you brought that in to tie it all together, because the moment you said that, I thought, this is what the Lord says about my finances. That's verses like 1 through 11 of chapter 2. This is what the Lord says about uh, having courage. That's uh, chapter 1, 12 through the end of the chapter. And then you have, this is what the Lord says about being uh, clean, holy, set apart in chapter 2. Like you have that all there where he's laying it out. This is what the Lord says. So how do I go back and decide? How do I give careful thought to certain areas in my life? Well, if they're not getting, getting bounced off of what the Lord says, then really have I given it careful thought? Right, because again, the thing of like, well, are you thinking about it? I can sit there and think about things mm -hmm. and I can give careful thought on things without bringing scripture into it. So I think that that's the distinction that we're getting to here is that um, that's the kind of careful thought that God is looking at. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that was really good. I like that. I did a thing. You did it. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks for noticing. Uh, all right, let's get into this. Uh, verses 1 through 11, it is this idea of uh, priorities and money and finances. It's so interesting. It has some of my favorite portions of the Bible in it now. And again, like we said last, uh, on the last episode, if Haggai isn't your favorite book of the Bible, by the time hopefully you're done listening to these two episodes, it will be. And if it's not after the episodes, go read it for yourself and then it will be. <laughs> yes, <laughs> if we've confused you enough. Uh, but give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but are never filled. You put on clothes, but not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. And then verse 7, give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord? Uh, because of my house, which remains in ruins, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of uh, you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. So it's this crazy concept of why I might never have enough is the way I looked at this portion of scripture. And it's because of my priorities. Like these people came back and they started building God's temple and they started doing what they were supposed to do. And then all of a sudden it was, 
all of a sudden the people came to stop them. So now they're like afraid to move forward with it. And they went back to build their own thing and they were building their own homes and they were building their own lives. They were building up for themselves and kept saying one day, you know, one day I'll be in a place where I can go back to give to God's kingdom. And I think that's where our priorities start getting missed. Yeah. And what you're saying ties into that thing of they're saying now isn't the time because you're looking around and now isn't the time. And I think that when you bring in the realness of that situation of all of those things that you listed off, like, hey, man, I'm working and it seems like I can't hold on to anything. We're planting. There's not enough food. And when we're looking at the place of just when you're not focusing on God, the result can seem like and the reality can be a lack. So then it puts you into the paradoxical position of well, now I feel like I don't have enough even for me. How am I going to give to God and, and put the effort there? It's interesting. I, I see a parallel, and I might have brought this up last time, but when Jesus says, seek first the kingdom and all else will be given, that whole passage there is when he's talking about, hey, don't you see the field, mm-hmm. right? Like Solomon with all of his riches, he's not as pretty as the flowers in the field. God does that. Or think about the birds. They don't have bank accounts and storing up storehouses, you know, whatever. And, but God takes care of them. Isn't he going to take care of you? Pagans worry about those things. People who don't have God worry about those things. I'm just saying the reality of that is, and here's why they probably worry about those things, because they find themselves in the situation of this early part of Haggai, that they're not focusing on God and they're finding themselves in a point of lack. So then they're worrying about those things. And Jesus says it, focus on the kingdom. Haggai's bringing it as a message. Hey, come back and, and build the house. Focus on the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that too, because what it brings into uh, the real thought process is that um, you can see people who have bank accounts that are just filled with money, millions, billions, but the pursuit to want more is still there. They feel like they don't have enough, you know, And, and, and it's just that concept of that when we're chasing after our own priorities or our own stuff without God in mind. It always does feel like there's not enough in there, that there is a hole in the purse, that there is a leaking out, that no matter how much I accumulate, it still doesn't satisfy. And, and maybe I'm reading a little bit more into this by just what we're talking about, but maybe that's the point here is that you won't be satisfied building your own thing, your own empire, your own kingdom. Uh, building God's kingdom is where pure satisfaction comes in. There's no emptiness in that feeling. There's no like oh, I'm losing this investment. It, it's, a, it's a pure joy or satisfaction just because God's number one. Like he's the top priority. With him being the top priority, it, it's interesting there that the relationship between man and God, but then man and nature, because there um, in verse 10, there on account of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth has withheld its crops. I've summoned a drought on the fields and the mountains, right? And just looking at, and a lot of times in the Old Testament it talks about, hey, the land is going to spit you out. Mm-hmm. And it's just so interesting to me that the effect that we're supposed to have as imagers of God on this planet, that we're supposed to be like branches to the vine, connected to the life source, bringing life, pushing Eden out around the whole globe and all these things, right? But when we're not that, it's like we have the opposite decaying effect. Oh, yeah. That like this isn't poetic. Like, it really didn't rain. The crops really didn't grow. Mm -hmm. But again, just going back to what you're saying, like prioritizing God, it does the thing of us as humans imaging him, we're supposed to have that connection, and that has an effect around us. And I think it's really cool. And like, it, it brings it beyond like the theological point, you know, and you can even, so this is talking about grain and everything, but I think that we see that even in our relationships with people. Right. Because if we're looking at the dryness of the ground and of that and like the fruitfulness, I don't know. You've admitted to it, but I'll admit to it, too. When I've been disconnected in my relationship with God, everything around me starts drying up. And like you were talking about, that it doesn't seem to be enough, but it also mm. seems like the fruitfulness and the joy and everything that's supposed to be there in relationships and just in the fullness of life. It's like that's not there anymore. Yeah. And you even read that when you read some of Solomon's parables. Mm right? The, the guy who had horses brought to him every year and hundreds of wives and money, gold. That's success. why he had problems. Yeah, that's why he had problems, man. That was way too many wives. Uh, but all the gold and everything, like he lived, also lived during a time of peace for the majority of it as he reigned as king. But there were parts of it where it just didn't seem like it was enough, right? Because there at some 
point with all of his wives bringing in the worship of different idols and him kind of succumbing to that and his relationship with God being disconnected, it allowed for that to, to kind of play in. But it, it's a very important thing here. And I really think what God's and Haggai is getting at here is this idea that God won't play second fiddle. He won't play second chair. He's not going to be second in our life. He wants to be number one. I really love this concept. And it just dawned on me like a few weeks ago of God's jealousy. And it was one of those areas where I struggled with because I didn't get what it meant for God to be jealous. I just thought of it more of like jealous. I want something that I don't have. Uh, I read it in a book and it said, God isn't jealous of us. He's jealous for us. Mm -hmm. And the, that, those two words of meaning like he's not jealous of us. He's not jealous of what I have. He's jealous of me. He's jealous for me. He wants a life with me. And you could see again, they, he was playing second fiddle. That's why things seem to just not go a certain way. And like you're saying, the crops and everything not withering. It wasn't, it wasn't our locust thing that we're looking at from the yeah. book of Joel, bringing it back to that. Uh, this was actual crops withering. They were just digging in the soil and nothing was producing. As someone who grows something in his backyard and grows stuff, it is the most annoying thing when you're watering something and tending to it and just seeing crops just not produce like they should. We're right now growing like tons of zucchini and stuff, but sometimes when they're not being pollinated properly or there's not uh, the right nutrients in the soil, a zucchini will start and you're like, man, look at all the zucchini we're about to get. And then they get a thing called end rot and it just withers and dies. And you're like, I saw five zucchini growing and now there's nothing. And it's just all that hard work, all that labor, all that toiling. Yeah. You, you really should have paid attention to God. I really should have been focusing should more have on Should have built God. his house. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a little house in the backyard now yeah god's house make things grow no, i don't use, think that's how it works you can wow <laughs> <laughs> wow i was gonna say uh it can be like for your uh piece of tabernacles or there booths is, right yeah. yeah yeah to be able to go and build up your little booth and it can be your mm -hmm. prayer booth back there it's yeah. actually pretty cool to have those kind of another thing that i came just as we're i think this is the last thing i can kind of maybe squeeze out of this section but I came across a letter from St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, to Irenaeus, and he was talking about this, and I'm not going to try and read the translation that I have from, I think he was writing in Latin or whatever, and then we have English, Latin, and King James Version-y type of stuff, so I would get lost reading it. Basically, when Haggai says, hey, you guys are dwelling in your houses, you should be focusing on God's house, he brings it to uh, what you're building spiritually, is that your sensual house, so to speak. Like if you're building in that, in the lower sphere of the earthly type of house, and you're focusing on that, then you're going to experience that. And those types of people can't build the temple of God. But it's like that this message is supposed to come in that now's the time to build the temple of God, which for us would be, we are the temple. So be working on that as you mm. get away from the sensual and move into the spiritual kind of a thing. Yeah. So he kind of spiritualized it a bit, taking these abodes. Looking at like, well, the earthly abode was what they were building for themselves. The heavenly abode is what they were building for God. So for us as Christians, because this is, you know, post-Christ, um, he was saying working on your earthly abode is all of the sensual the way of living that's just focused on this earth. And I'm re repeating myself, but focus on the spiritual life is the equivalent of, hey, go and build God's temple. Yeah, it's making, uh, so when we're building for ourselves, we're making the things of this earth, pleasures, desires, right. the priority. And when we're building eternally the kingdom inside of ourselves are making a relationship with God the priority. Yeah, I, I heard uh, Chris Brown say this, and I thought it was pretty cool, and it tied into what we're going through with this section. And then I'll read one more thing, and then we can move on to the next part. But he said, uh, contentment doesn't come from what's in my house. Contentment comes from what you're doing in God's house. And kind of tying that into the physical realm of what are you doing in God's house, but also that spiritual realm, like you're saying, the, the internal if if I'm God, if the temple is inside of me, if I'm the temple, then am I working on that relationship with God? And is my relationship with God the priority in my life? That that's the big one. And I think getting into verse nine, it says, uh, "You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why?" declares the Lord, because uh, of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. And to me, I highlighted and I circle like that word busy in my Bible because I feel like that's the thing nowadays. Like people are just so busy. Like it's, 
cool to be busy. It's almost like if you ask someone, hey, what's going on? They're like, oh, you know, busy, busy, busy. It's almost like the trendy thing to say and do. But I feel like that's done such a damage to people that they're so busy. It's torn almost the very fabric of their relationship with God and with other people. I was watching a TikTok and the person went off in a full different direction, but they were talking basically the everything's relative and everything's man-made and everything's like human construct. It was that kind of video and kind of argument. Mm -hmm. But they did bring up the point of like productivity. Like why is productivity one of the metrics by which we as humans try to live by? Like who put that on us? That, oh, mm -hmm. you need to be super productive and make sure you like, who is that serving? And what is that for? Like we literally just came up with that. A different culture could exist without that, you know, but we don't know what that's really like in America or in Western countries. And so, yeah, just that. And oh, I really man, so busy. feel it's such a like a newer thing, too, that productivity, being busy, like if you're not productive, you're not doing something good. But I mean, it's what you're being productive at. Right. Is the important thing. Like right. I could be doing nothing but reading my Bible, but I'm pretty sure that's more productive than tons of other things where I'm actually doing something that seems noticeably accomplishable. Did your crops not have a good harvest? Are you working hard, expecting much, only for it to turn out to be a little? Do you feel like there must be a big old hole in your bank account or that you never seem to have enough? Thankfully, none of that's an issue at Jimbo's used car lot. Feel free to come by and walk the lot of his amazing luxurious cars. You might just find that special vehicle, that one that fulfills all your wants. Worried about that bottom line? Jimbo will have you sit down with his wonderful financing department to work out a great deal. In fact, Jimbo is currently offering a fantastic money-saving plan for a $100 month auto loan at the low, low 38% interest rate. So stop by Jimbo's used car lot today. Jimbo's used car lot is located across the street from the Anger Emporium and adjacent to the Beef Gristle Mill. Give careful thought to your ways. Stop by Jimbo's to take advantage of some awesome deals today. Yeah, that's the first section. Um, last thing to wrap up that section. I think that I mentioned it last time, but from St. Gregory the Great, uh, he said that this is basically how to admonish those who do not indeed crave the goods of others, yet withhold their own. So just talking about being busy and whatever, just like they're not craving what other people have. They're just not giving of what they have. So they're busy. They're not giving what they have. And, you know, that's kind of what God is touching in on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have this on my notes. I really wish I would have brought this out when you said it. But uh, droughts and economic crisis had resulted from the people and from God's people. That when we're talking about the land and everything being barren. And I just thought like, man, that was God's people who kind of because of being selfish and building for them own self, got themselves into that situation. Was this in Joel or another time that I was saying, I'm not going to say it, but it sure seems like some of the things that we might be going through today yeah, I think it was seems Joel. like yeah. things that they were going through back then. And some of the reasons why they were going through it back then is they weren't really paying attention to God. So I'm not going to point the finger or say that that's definitely what's happening today. But the parallels are kind of interesting. And I would kind of wonder like, hey, what if we just tested the hypothesis and paid more attention to God and see if things get better? <laughs> <laughs> see what happens, right? Uh, so that's what the people did is they pay attention. And Haggai, this is your favorite portion here. Yes. They paid attention to God. And one of my favorite words in the Bible now is the word then. Because that's what we get in verse 12. Then everybody listened and obeyed the voice of God. So I really enjoy the word then because it does usually, it's a change of something that happens within a book or writing. Most of the time it's like something's happening and then pops in and it's a whole change of course and direction. And so for this section, it was then um, and then they obeyed. Zerubbabel, Joshua, as well as the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him. So the people feared the Lord. I think that that's my favorite word in the Bible. All of those. <laughs> the governor, the priest, the people all obeyed. That's my favorite word. That's your favorite word now? Yeah. Going forward? 
hyphen 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 hyphen, 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 hyphen all hyphen. together one word yeah. but it's the then uh, it's just this progression it's then they obeyed so they heard the word of god then they obeyed and then god said i am with you it, it's almost like it's the necessity for really having a real relationship with god is the obeying part like if i don't have that why am i going to think he's going to be with me if i'm not obeying and doing that? basically he becomes my genie, right? He's just like, be here with me when I'm going through dark times, but then when dark times are gone, I'm going to go do my thing. Stop looking at me. I can't say it, Chris. Say it. I can't be the rude person, Chris. Be the rude person. Usually it's me. Go for no, it. No, honestly, Delilah was talking to me because she actually listens to the podcast. Hi, Delilah. I love you. Um, I was like, oh, cool. She's listening to the podcast. And then the other day she told me, she was just like, hey, you know, you kind of come across... A little, I think she said mean. I was like, what? How do I come across mean? I was like, what do you mean? And then I was like, give me an example. And then she thought about it. She's like, no, maybe you just come across awkward. I was like, okay. And she gave an example of something that you had said. And then I tried to come in with a point and it just fell flat. And she's like, it would have been funny if Chris just calls you on your stupidity. And then you can laugh about it. But instead, he's just like, all right, moving on from whatever that was. <laughs> And then we're at your party, and apparently you guys talk about me behind my back because Delilah's like, oh, yeah, when you left, um, I won't mention who because people who listen to this would might know by name because might have been a guest on the show at some point, said that I can be pretentious. <laughs> and I'm like, I mean, awkward and pretentious. I don't know how to be on this show anymore. So I'm, I have all that in my mind after you just said what you just said. And I really think because you said, there are so many people who never come to the point of desiring to obey God and spend so much of their time worrying about whether or not God is with them. And it's no wonder we worry about these things, because why would you have assurance of such? Not that we are going to be sinlessly perfect, well, if the desire of your heart isn't what these people, the desire of their heart was, is like, oh, that's the word of God. Like, we want to obey that. We're going to fear the Lord. We're going to listen to him. Let's move in that direction. Like, if you haven't had that, or if you had that, and you walked away from that, and you've just gotten loosey-goosey with your stuff, it's like, no wonder you're sitting there questioning, like, well, is, is God still with me? And you're wondering, like, how come he's not declaring to me, I'm with you? It's like, well, what you said, he's jealous for you. He's wanting you to come to him. Right, you turn to him, he turns to you. He like it's there, it's a relationship. And I'm sorry, it's just what you said about obedient and people looking for that and stuff. It just just because you said the prayer, like if you if your desires towards God haven't changed, like you're still gonna have those questions, you're still gonna have that anxiety. You won't have that assurance. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I said the prayer as a my backup plan. Honestly, in some ways, yeah, but I've, I've said this a lot of times too, is new people might have just said the prayer because that's all that they were told to do. Yeah. How are they going to know any different? Mm -hmm. So we need like Haggai coming and saying, hey, specifically, declares the Lord, declares the Lord, declares the Lord, declares the Lord. And people go, okay, we'll go with that. You even look at it from like Jonah who went in there as a prophet and he was like, I know what happens when I tell people declares the Lord, <laughs> yeah. right? The people repent. So he went into Nineveh and he's like, here's what God says. At least the good godly pagans over in Nineveh, yeah, <laughs> they'll repent. They'll repent. Uh, and they did, right? And they changed the, the whole people. They changed. Even the cows were like mourning and putting on sackcloth and ash and doing all this stuff. <laughs> Jonah was so upset. Yes, he was. Uh, but here we see this beautiful picture of the people responding the correct way. And, and what I really love is verse 14. Uh, so the Lord stirred up the spirit in everybody like you're saying the governor the priest the people it's a beautiful thing to see this progression in these next few verses again this is why it's one of my favorite verses you have a message of god being said you have complete obedience then you have the spirit being stirred up and like you were saying there are times in our lives when we're like how do i i don't feel god with me uh, it, it could be a good portion of your life because you're doing what you want to do and not what god wants you to do the stirring of the Spirit came after the serving to the Spirit. After they served and they went back to do it, then the Spirit started serve, uh, stirring inside of their lives, right. noticeably. So they heard the Word. They mm -hmm. sought to obey the Word. God says, I'm with you. Their spirits were stirred up. 
And then it says, and they came and began the work on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Right. So they went out to go do the thing. And again, just, just to bring it back to the, that thing, because this is more of our pastoral type of episode of kind of looking at it that way and to give flesh out that thing. of It's not just about the prayer. Going back to the thing of Jesus saying, seek first the kingdom. And we've also, we also brought up repentance when we brought up these things, right? Hearing the gospel, hearing what Jesus has done, hearing about the goodness of God, hearing about our own sinfulness and the life that we could have with him and all of these things that are freely offered to us, right? To hear those words and say, yes, I'll go in that direction. And then to seek the kingdom, which again is the equivalent of began to work on the house of the Lord. It's like, so seeking the kingdom is following Jesus. Following Jesus means... And it starts with your thoughts. Those thoughts become your mm-hmm. actions, become your habits, become your lifestyle. And that's what discipleship is, right? So, yeah, I think that the level of involvement that you have in actually building the kingdom of, you know, working on the house of the Lord, as Haggai puts it, you'll, you'll see that come through. Yeah. I can't sense God with me. Well, you can't sense God with you if you're not honoring him. If you're honoring yourself and living for your own pleasures, building up your own house in a sense. Yeah, you're not going to sense him. Like, he's not going to be present because your life is so filled with you. And I think this is the message that's coming across is that if your life is so filled with you, it's not going to be filled with him. I feel like I was being a bit of a downer in how I was talking about that. I don't know if it's just how I hear my own voice. I'm waving my hand so much right now. Ever since you brought up Reed waving his hand and hitting his sister, I feel like I've been waving him around like crazy. Like I'm doing a podcast with the wacky, wavy, inflatable tube guy. <laughs> yeah, for real. For the record, though, uh, for the record, if anyone wants to go back and listen to the episode, it's season two. I believe it's the second episode. It's called Christian Catchphrases. You could go back and actually hear who called you pretentious. And I'll leave it at that. Because it was someone in the room we're sitting in now, but it wasn't me. I called myself pretentious? Yes, you did. <laughs> oh, weird. <laughs> just for the record, just throw that out there. So it, someone was quoting me calling myself pretentious? <laughs> That's weird. Inception. <laughs> okay, well, that just threw me off of what I was going to talk about, which was, I feel like just the tone of my voice or whatever just... It, <sighs> It's just such a serious thing to me because I'm so saddened and grieved at the parts of my life where I've lived estranged from God and seen what has come of that. And that when I consider other people in that situation, what that looks like, it it does bring a level of sadness. But on the flip side of that, the level of joy that comes with what we're seeing here in this book of that obedience. And I think that maybe if I was to just jump ahead into chapter two, saying, hey, consider that on this day, a stone hasn't been set on another stone. But from this day on, I'm going to bless you. And just looking at the result of, hey, your money pockets had holes in it and nothing was working out for you and all of the stuff. And God says, from this point, you haven't even started working on the thing yet, but I'm going to start blessing you because you've come to me, you've returned to me, and we have a good relationship now. And again, for me experiencing that personally and that that's such a good thing that I desire everyone to be able to experience is like, man, God can start blessing you immediately. He's not like, hey, fix yourself up first. And then like, we'll see, like, we'll, we'll catch back up in a couple months. Like, he's just, can you return to me? Mm-hmm. And from that moment forward, things change. Yeah, it was a huge turning point for them. And when he says, I'm with you, uh, what I really look at that is uh, when we rely on God for all things, he will act powerfully among us. Like when we rely on God in our lives, he acts. Like when we're talking about like we don't fill him with us and wanting the blessing of him coming even before we started doing the work. Once he comes with us, once we get beyond the part of like, it's not just a prayer, it's actually a lifestyle that you have to live. Like it's a full-blown commitment of wanting a relationship with him. Then he's with us and he acts in, in a powerful way. You start seeing God do things and change things because they, they built the temple and it's there. And that's what we get into the beginning of chapter two. They built the temple and it's there. And like uh, Ezra chapter three, I believe, um, says that they, we talked about it. In this now last you're doing episode. the hand yeah. thing. I am doing the hand <laughs> thing. Dang it. Uh, uh, chapter three of Ezra says the young man cheered and the old men, they were crying and they couldn't tell the difference because one was uh, saddened because they... It was Solomon's temple, and they rem- remembered that. And the other ones were cheering because they're like, "Look at what we were able to accomplish through God here." But 
that temple being built uh, is so significant. Like Haggai tells them, there's going to be glory returning to this. And we touched on it a little bit on the last episode, but I really love the concept of that glory was Jesus filling that temple, that he walked through that place specifically. And he, he went in there and preached and taught and changed lives in that place. And it was such a cool tie-in that maybe the temple didn't have the pompousness of what Solomon's was, but it had the holiness of what God wanted it to be because the holiness came when Christ started walking into it. Now, when I personalize that, I could build my own temple and it could look grand and beautiful. But if it's not filled with God, if it's not filled with Jesus, all it is is, like we were saying, it's a me. It's a facility to glorify myself. But if I'm building God's temple, it doesn't need to be the big pompous place. It just needs to be filled with him. And that's where we're getting at. This is all about priorities and making God number one in our our relationship with him. When I personalize this, and this might hit for some of our listeners, but it really is how I read this in a different way that's not on the study side of things. When we look at man Solomon's temple and it was built up and just have all of its grandeur and all the stuff and man, here's God's not in the tent anymore. Now here's this temple and the Shekinah glory comes down and just all of this. And when I think about it personally, like I think of that as the time when I first came to faith. And just the Holy Spirit coming in and dwelling and just feeling like there's been this new creation that's been made, right? It's Mm -hmm. like I was that temple that got built up that was like, I felt beautiful. I felt new. I felt amazing. I could sense God with me in those ways. And it was like Solomon's temple is like if I relate it to that. But then if we look at, well, what happened to Solomon's temple? The people through disobedience and through chasing after other things and through everything, they went into exile and the temple got torn down. And when I personalize it and I just look at like that happened in my Christian walk is that I got distracted. I got disobedient. I chased after different things. And that feeling and how I viewed myself even from when I first came back to faith to then, I was just like, oh, it's rubbles. It's not there. And there was also the process of God redeeming me from that and coming like, all right, well, let's rebuild. He's like, I'm not done with you. Let's rebuild. It's kind of like what the Haggai came like, all right, stop working on your own stuff now. Like, focus on this. And I feel like how he rebuilt me, how even God says, how does it look to you now? Does it not appear like nothing in comparison? And that was even my own thoughts. Because when I first came to faith, everything seemed so pristine. Like, oh man, the old life is washed away and everything. But I felt like I ruined that. And like, even though it got rebuilt, like it just didn't have the same oomph to it you know what i mean and so that's how i felt like just looking like i'm I'm glad that i'm redeemed but I, it just feels like a lesser version i feel like i've relegated myself to i'm one of those christians who messed up mm-hmm. and I, it's not the same as one of those that was on fire that never screwed up and just kept running i fell so this part really speaks to me from that and especially from my view of myself when in that rebuilding is how God comes in and says, be strong, Zerubbabel, be strong, Joshua, be strong, all the people. Get to work for I'm with you, declares the Lord. It's the promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains among you. Don't be afraid. That thing of coming up out of Egypt, man, that was coming out of my life of sin. He's saying, just like I rescued you from that old life, I'm still with you, which is what we talked about in that last episode. So just here, of just it was the personal encouragement to me, which is, I'm still with you. I took you out of the sin. It's still, I'm still same God. Be strong. Mm -hmm. Work on the things I've called you to work on. Forget about what you think it looks like. I'm with you. So that's this whole thing with the temple to the temple with like the destruction and rebuilding and stuff. Like it's really how I viewed my Christian walks. Like, man, everything was so pristine and so good. And then I screwed it up and I felt like less of a Christian when I was able to put it somewhat back together. And just the encouragement here. Yeah, and it even brings us into the next section of the book where he's talking about uh, if someone touches a dead thing, that person now becomes defiled. Mm -hmm. But if someone touches uh, a clean thing, that doesn't make them clean. 
I, I struggled with that portion of it because I didn't really get the concept of it. But the warning is like the, the first temple was defiled. They brought sin into it. And if we're looking at sin and what it ultimately does is sin is death. So it's a dead thing. And when you're bringing your dead thing, your sin into the temple, they defiled it. They were worshiping other gods in it. They were doing all the stuff that they shouldn't do. So that one got destroyed and leveled. Kind of your, your great analogy of your own life, right? The, I, I came to a relationship with God, but then I just kept bringing my sin into that thing and destroyed it. And then when God finally said, all right, let's rebuild, it wasn't the big grandioso thing, but it was, a, it was the thing that was filled with him more. Mm -hmm. And when that came in, then there was like this peace in your life, right? Which is in verse 9. And in this place, I will be, there will be peace. That's just ultimately a relationship with God brings us to a, a place of where there's full peace in our life, no matter what we're going through. But going back to the, the other section and tying it all together is uh, I heard this and I, this is what made this totally make sense, this defilement. If you send, and this is pre-COVID, if you sent your kid to school, your sick kid to school, you're concerned that your sick kid is going to make all the other kids sick, right? Because that's usually what happens with kids and people is that when you're sick, you go around someone else, you make them sick. You don't send a healthy kid into a group of a bunch of unhealthy kids and hope that he's going to make them unhealthy. Like you don't send a kid who's not sick into a group of kids that's uh, sick and hope that that's going to make them better. Only if they're Jesus or an apostle. Exactly. <laughs> so that made me, all of a sudden, this whole section made sense. It's how we're living. It's how we're doing things. What are we bringing into God's temple? And the warning here that Haggai's giving them is, look it, if you do that, if you go back to the way they were living, if you come in here, you're defiled. You're going to make this place unclean. It's only when you start living holy and set apart for God are you going to keep this place clean. And it, it really came to this idea that living in the Holy Land didn't make them holy. Mm -hmm. Coming to church and doing all the churchy Christian things doesn't make you holy. It has to come from having a real relationship with God that you are getting washed off. Uh, I, I said this in the message I spoke on Sunday, um, and I thought it fit perfectly for this, but making church a priority on the weekend doesn't make God a priority in your life. And if he's not a priority, then there's no way you're going to stay, in the sense, clean. You're going to dip back into those things that you used to do. You're going to fall away because uh, what, what do we talk about? That um, the replacement love thing, you've got to love God more than whatever vice it is that's in your life. Because if not, that other thing's going to outwin. You're going to say, I love this more than him. And you had two different analogies there. So I'm going to go to the first one and come to the second one. <laughs> first one, you're talking about the kids going in and being sick and just what that looks like. It reminded me of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 33 saying, don't be deceived, bad company corrupts good character. <laughs> just made me think of like, like if you're going out and hanging around a bunch of people or whatever, like it will work in the way that they will affect you. Yeah. For the most part, have integrity person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Speaking to myself, have integrity when you're around people. You don't need to fall into things. But for the most part, it's like, if all you're hanging around is people who are against God or act a certain way or do certain things, sooner or later, you'll probably start speaking that way and doing those things. And, you know, to whatever extent, it doesn't really work the other way around so much. So that was on that first part. As far as the second part of, yeah, prioritizing church on the weekend doesn't make God a priority in your life. I agree. And you had said something in there as well that you said that we need to be washed. And I think that I mentioned this in the last episode, but part of the thing about the temple being put back in, because when you're looking about defilement, you're looking at all these things being ritually impure and unclean and defiled there was a method of which to become pure and clean and everything and it involved the temple being built up and involved the sacrifices and involved properly executing upon god's law and what that looked like so that people could be in right standing be able to come into god's presence what that is now for us as christians the sacrifice is jesus and yeah like you were saying all those things coming into life like yeah make our life dirty that's where scripture says hey Go and confess these things. And Jesus, mm -hmm. he's faithful and righteous and just to forgive you and cleanse you of everything. Right? For as often as it happens, we get to go to Jesus and be cleansed of those things so that we're not walking around in this defiled state because we touch something unclean. You know, I'm doing air quotes, so to speak. You know, things that we see or things that we interact with or whatever it is that happens, whether purposefully or accidental, God's goal for us that we would be pure, that we would be holy, that we would be set apart in a way that's completely otherly. 
that we would live like Jesus. Yeah, I think the important part too is being the the set apart and being holy and the beauty of what God offers us and that cleansing. I was actually thinking about that today or today or yesterday, one day. It was a couple of days ago. It was a couple of days ago. This week, I was, uh, was thinking about this concept of like forgiveness, and and we had talked a little bit about it before the show. <laughs> that, was like, that was thirty minutes ago. Chris. That's when we were talking. <laughs> this was a previous conversation for myself. Um, uh, one of the areas that I really struggle with is the remembering of my own faults, whether they're yesterday, today, or whatever. Uh, but I could pray and say, "God, forgive me." And His book, it's like wash clean. But in mine, I keep a remembrance of it or I keep a, it's there, it's in my life. And I really did struggle with that. And I, and I still think that's a, a part of an area where I struggle with on why I, certain areas in my life I would deem myself unworthy. Where I know I, I before Christ, I'm, I was condemned. But with him, there's no unworthiness. I am worthy. I'm holy. Uh, but me holding on to that record book or me keeping a list of I did these things in the past. Not as a way to witness or encourage other people, but to keep me in a bondage. Like my own unforgiveness of myself keeps me in a bondage. And then I'm going around and, and that's still in me. And yeah, I'm not being wholly set apart, consecrated. So then I'm communicating with other people and in a sense, defiling that in, in their, being in their presence. Uh, but where he washes us clean, we are now clean and pure the realness and the fullness of our identity in Jesus. Like you were saying, hey, it's forgiven, it's forgotten, we've been made new, and all the stuff that it's like the future justified righteous us mm -hmm. is brought into now, and we're viewed and treated that way, and everything that comes with that. Scripture talks about that our life is hidden in Christ with God, and all of these things that like how God truly views us. And obviously we need to walk the day to day and keep ourselves pure and repent and do different things. But our identity that is really, nope, that was a before. That doesn't stick on you. It's, you're like Teflon. If you've repented and you've gotten forgiveness and you've been washed clean, it's not there. The completeness of that, it's a hard thing to grapple. With yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, the remembrance that we keep. I'm not sure if you saw me smirk because you were saying, when I go to pray, I, I struggle with remembering my own sin. I was like, dude, aren't you married? <laughs> and they're like, no, I do remember it. That's the problem. I was like, oh, okay, I see what you're doing. It's a tough one. It's, and we I are think, far more loved than we could ever comprehend. Really what I think why the struggle is there is because, um, you know, we get to the end of this book almost, almost in the end of chapter two where it talks about the blessing, right? God will bless you. And we want to equate blessings to stuff, to things, to like actually receiving something physical. And when I'm not receiving the stuff or things, I feel like God isn't with me. I feel like I'm, he's not blessing me, so I don't feel like I'm completely forgiven. But that's looking at it from a very worldly perspective. When I really break down this concept of what's being blessed, it's not about getting things. It's about having a relationship with God that when my relationship with God is good, I'm in a state of blessedness. I'm constantly moving in blessedness no matter what the circumstance is because I'm getting fulfillment not from the outer exterior things, but from the internal things, the presence of God being with me. And when I really look at this, it's really that there isn't a promise about wealth, success, or anything, but there's a, an assurance that God will provide the necessary resources to accomplish his purpose. And the real promise is his presence. I am with you. And that rings out throughout the whole 38 verses of this small little book that I really see as this big thing. And when I, when I look at it and I like break this down into like, hey, I'm a pastor teaching the book of Haggai now, it's make God a priority and then to seek God's presence. Like that's it in our life. If we make God a priority and we seek his presence, we're going to find fulfillment in the richness of life, that, that life in fulfillment that Jesus talks about. It, it's in those two things. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And uh, does that mean now if I say, hey, how are you doing? You're going to say, I'm blessed. Yeah, I should, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I always thought that was weird when people said that. But that's why. But that's why. The way yeah, that you just yeah. explained it yeah, is no, just it like, sense. It's, it's the reality of that answer. Do you know Matt Macedo who comes to the church? Yes. Yeah. He, he has that answer. As a, I say, how are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm blessed, brother. But he says it so genuinely that I know that that's 
how he feels in his relationship with God. You know, it's not just the can answer. Go, go back and listen to that episode <laughs> of Christian like catchphrases or whatever. But he really means it. And it, every time I hear him, I'm just like, I want to be coming from that place and to be speaking from that place. Yeah, it's a total change of uh, what we talked about earlier in the episode where it's like, hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm busy, busy. Everything's busy. Change it to blessed. Carefully consider your ways. Carefully and consider your, your words. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, because yeah. the careful consideration, if you, if you think about like, oh, I'm busy all the time, I'm busy all the time. It's like, no, no, no. What are you really? Mm-hmm. I'm blessed. Mm-hmm. And it comes from that. Again, if you think about something and then that can set you on the path that's different. And how different if you walk around your life all day saying like, with your life all day. I don't even know if I'm Englishing right now. But <laughs> if I'm Englishing, <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you're just thinking, oh, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, right? Versus mm-hmm. like, I'm blessed. Just that one replacement is so vital. Yeah. Now that's just one. Just one if you give Good. careful thought of your ways. Yeah. And then those two other points that you brought up, like, what was it as far as Haggai? Oh. You're saying if you're teaching them? Let me go back to my notes. Uh, it's make God a priority and to seek God's presence. And it's that thing of bringing it into thinking, God is a priority in my life, right? If he's like, mm-hmm. I wish he was, it's like, well, is he? Yes. Cool, then he is. And just, you know, operate from that point of view. Hmm. There's a couple things that we didn't touch on. And I don't know if you want to jump around. There's in two different places. Which one? Are you down? Go for it. Let's see. Okay. So one of the things in chapter two, verses six, seven, eight, nine, mostly actually six and seven. This is what the Lord of hosts says. Once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and they will come with all the treasures and I'll fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. So looking at that shaking, if I can pull up my notes. I kind of got an idea where you're going with this and I don't know if it's going to be where you're going. So I'm not going to say it yet. So look, I've got a different translation in my notes from what I just read it. But basically Matthew 24 Mm -hmm. talking about immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Uh, Luke chapter 21, people will faint from terror, apprehensive of what's coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And just looking at, there's other scriptures in Isaiah 13, the stars of heaven like constellations will not show their light, the rising sun will be darkened, moon will not give its light. Basically, I'm trying to shoehorn in the day of the Lord. <laughs> I don't think it's a shoehorn. <laughs> yeah. No, no. When you read it, it and, I, and honestly, until the moment you read it right now, I didn't catch it. I read the whole book. I read it again earlier today. And I was like, man, this sucks that Haggai is the one so far that we haven't talked about the day of the Lord. And then you read it in the way you read it in that somber voice of yours. Um, I got it. My I was somber, like, pretentious yeah, voice. Your somber, pretentious voice. Uh, oh, no, it wasn't pretentious. You called yourself a provocateur. Yeah, so that's what happened. I call myself a provocateur, and then apparently that makes me pretentious. Makes you pretentious, yes. Anyways, the day of the Lord. Uh, uh, I did catch that, that that is a day of the Lord verbiage right there, that he is referring to that, that the people reading it would understand what he was saying. And when you even think of the day of the Lord in the sense that when Jesus died on the cross, the earth shook, and there was a great shaking, and then the glory filled. Um, so yes, I did catch that, that they're here, even in this book, we still get a mention of the day of the Lord in reference. Yeah. So it's one of those things, direct quote versus an illusion versus there's a lot of things that I'm sure that you've come across it when you study is like, oh yeah, it kind of uses that verbiage or the pattern of speaking. Yeah. And I just, um, where was it that I was reading? Or maybe it was a podcast, but it was saying for as important as word studies are when you're, when you're reading the Bible is that patterns are like better to pay attention to than words and to catch those patterns of freight and phrasings and stuff so yeah just looking at that as far as uh things being shaken and and all Mm -hmm. that i was like "Ooh, day of the lord in there you know what's interesting is that uh prior to this when we were setting up this season and you're like uh what do you think the day of the lord is you text me that and i was like oh gosh let me give an answer that sounds close enough to being right i didn't really i would have been so afraid if anyone asked me what the day of the lord is through this series so far what we've done through my own personal study since that i'm like we need to do an episode on the day of the lord just somewhere to slide in between the season uh so that way we can talk through the many stages because it is like you're saying there's actual verbiage of it but then there's patterns of it 
I like how you, I, I just send you that random text because I'm like, I wonder what he thinks. And you're like, oh, I need to come up with something good. And I'm over here just like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm pretty confused. There's a lot of people saying a lot of things. I don't yeah. agree with a lot of the popular stuff, but there's, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. So a Day of the Lord episode. Can I teaser something else? Sure. When I thought that we were doing the book of Jude. And I was like, oh, this gets into the book of Enoch. Oh, yeah. We might have to do an episode on the book of Enoch, a real forgotten book you of the Bible. We might have to do an uh, episode on the book of Enoch. So the yeah. day of the Lord, which honestly, pretty sure that's going to tie into Enoch as well. Anyways, that's another other other thing to be continued in the future. The other thing that I want to bring up from Haggai, though, was just the end of the chapter. Unless you had day of the Lord stuff that you wanted to go on. No, I didn't really have much. I just uh-huh. wasn't I'll sure. I'll save it yeah. for that episode now. Basically, second time on that same day, the word of the Lord came to Haggai. So he came out and said, tell Zerubbabel. So now it's not Zerubbabel and Joshua. This is just straight for Zerubbabel. I will overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. I will overturn chariots and their riders. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord. And I will make you my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. You have anything in that? Other than the last, I, I did a, I gave a lot of what I had for that in the last episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, other than that, I have chosen you part, the way the book ends, mm-hmm. which is so beautiful. I mean, if, if I know this is a message directly to a person, right. but to interpret it even as I read it for myself, that God had chosen me in a sense. Uh, just makes me feel more special. It makes me feel more loved. Yeah, so I'm the same way with that section, is that, yes, it was to Zerubbabel. He was being used in a very specific way by God to go and do those things, and historically, and that. So, yes, as far as Bible study goes, we should not take what was for one person and just go, hey, that's for me, because that Mm -hmm. sounds cool. However, I think that uh, the scriptures are supposed to be meditative and complicated. What's the one I'm trying? Completative. What's the one you think about it? Completative? You're asking the wrong. You really got to edit some of this out. <laughs> I know that you won't. So future Chris, I'm upset that you're leaving this in. <laughs> contemplative. That's the word. Is the word. Meditative and contemplative. To where we're supposed to take these things and chew on them and look at them from different perspectives and, you know, try and suss out some stuff from it. So, yes, this is a message from Zerubo, for Zerubbabel. But when you talked about that being chosen and just knowing that you're loved, I think of uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 2. You were chosen by God the Father long ago. He knew you were to become his children. You were set apart for holy living by the Holy Spirit. May you obey Jesus Christ and be made clean by his blood. May you be full of his loving favor and peace. That just wraps up so many of the different Mm -hmm. things that we talked about this episode. But landing on that, you were chosen by God to be set apart, to be cleansed, to be in his love, be in his peace. Like all that stuff is so good. So I get that same thing coming from there. I don't know if it's just my personality too when I read this and I'm just like, I want to be special. But going back to that thing of like, I feel like God did put a calling on my life to be in ministry and to be in pastoral and preaching and everything else. And when I know that what we're a part of as Christians, our battle isn't against flesh and blood, but it's against powers and principalities. And it's to free people from darkness and from their bondage to sin and all these things. That when I see this thing of I'll overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations, I'll overturn chariots and the riders, horses and the riders will fall each by the sword of his brother. I'm just like, yeah, Satan. Yeah, yeah, principalities. Like God's going to use me to overturn what you got going on in the lives of people around me. And, you know, just like, I don't know if that's me just wanting to be all bravado or like, yeah, cool, warrior talk. I want to be in that. But really just looking at it of just, I know I'm chosen, but chosen for what? And why am I still here on this earth? And I just connect with this on that level. Again, I'm extrapolating a little bit. Yeah. But uh, maybe romanticizing my life and making it more adventuresome. But, hey, (laughs) if you don't have dragons to slay in your life, your life is boring. Yeah. So you got to get some dragons. You got to go slay them. Oh, man. I'm going to throw a grenade on all of this and Do make it. us feel worse. And then I'm going to wrap up the show because my kids are driving me nuts because they're with us in the recording studio. If you're, if you're leaving in my stuttering, at least have Reed come in when he said, I just want to give you a hug. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe. Depends. <laughs> uh, you're talking about destroying dragons in Zerubbabel. 
is the continuation of the Davidic line. We talked about this in the last episode. <laughs> and th- what really clicked when is when I when you're talking about I have chosen you and I thought of Jesus when he was getting baptized. Here is my son whom I love and all that thing, right? Mm-hmm. Chosen for that purpose. And as the rubble is the reason why that line continues from David to Jesus. Uh, although this is a message for Zerubbabel, it also could be a prophetic word talking about Jesus who will overturn powers and foreign kingdoms and dragons because he did destroy the dragon and we have, an episode on we have a whole episode on the dragon and he did come through and do that and he was chosen for that purpose and for that reason and now i get to live in the peace of his victory that's cool yeah right that's pretty good. All right, I'm going to end it because I don't think I'll say anything smarter than that. I only have one last thing to say. Okay, cool, because I'm not going to say anything other than my name. We talked about the significance of the signet ring last time. Mm-hmm. So go listen and then come back. I want my life here on this earth to be like God's signet ring to just like his authority, his power, his signature, his everything is all over my life. That when people see how I live and all of that, they're just like, mm, I can see God there. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just what I want my life to be. Like, I just think that's such a cool thing. It's like, I'm going to make you my signet ring. like, man, how cool to just look at your life as like God's signature on the earth. Like, yep, look at what I did. Signed off on it. That when I make a mark in someone's life, it's not me. It's God's mark left on them. Man, you're just full of them, huh? I that's know. good, too. All right, let's wrap up before <laughs> before I lose this. <laughs> End one. on a high yeah, note. Yeah, it was that, that Seinfeld episode where George Costanza ends all of uh, his meetings once he says the funny joke, and he's yeah. like, all, all right, right. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> so I am out. I'm Chris. I'm Mirda. We're your church friends. Thanks for listening. Habakkuk. Nahum. Obadiah. Jude, Philemon, Haggai, Amos, 